Um, and we're also glad to have uh, Professor Scoville in person. He was going to come in by Zoom, but was generous enough to say that he would be able to be here. Um, prior to this, uh, he was an Associate Professor of International Affairs at the George H.W. Bush School of Government and Public Service and Director of the China Certificate Program at Texas A&M University in College Station, Texas. From 1999 till 2007, he was Associate Research Professor in the Strategic Studies Institute at the U.S. Army War College and Adjunct Professor of Political Science at Dickinson College, both located in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. His publications include China in the Middle East, the Wary Dragon uh, by the Rand Corporation, PLA Influence on China's National Security Policy Making, Stanford, um, China's Search for Security, Columbia University Press, China's Use of Military Force, Beyond the Great Wall and the Long March, Cambridge. Scoville was born and raised in Hong Kong and regularly makes research trips to the region. He earned a doctorate in political science from Columbia University. Thank you, Susan, for that uh, kind introduction. Yeah, I mean, let's face it, adjuncts, adjuncts anywhere are exploited people, right? <laughs> but um, we, we, uh, cho I choose to be exploited because I enjoy uh, George Georgetown uh, University treats its adjuncts very, very, very well, uh, which is rare in my experience because I've adjuncted, adjuncted, adjuncted elsewhere. Um, I want to say. I have very few slides, uh, and I'm going to use them to talk a little bit. And unless you have, if you have a quick question, I'm going to try and move relatively quickly um, without uh, without speaking um, at 95 miles an hour. Uh, but if you have a quick question, if you have a question or quick question of clarification, please ask it. But uh, if, if it's a longer question, I would request that you hold it towards the end, till the end. So. Um, but uh, you know, you, you'd be the judge of which is a quick question <laughs> and which which is uh, which is not. Um, I, I'm basing uh, what I'm about to present to you on three things. Uh, three things that I published. Uh, one, the book uh, that I'm proud to be a part of. A chapter in this uh, book on China, China and the Middle East, which I really I'm biased a little bit, but I have having done some research on this topic. Um, look, finding something that's contemporary, current, and comprehensive ain't easy. And this, this is the best thing out there. Not because there's lots of other things out there that aren't so good, it's just that there really isn't much else out there. There are a few things, but I highly recommend, this is a great reference book. And you've got, I guess you've all been given college. Yeah. That's, that's fabulous. Uh, the, other, uh, the other book uh, that this I'm about to uh, say uh, is based on in my Rand Report, China in the Middle East, my co-author, who's, who's an expert on Iran. Uh, so this is available online for free. I mean, you can download the PDF for free. If you want to buy a print copy, you've got to pay, uh, unless you work for the US government, um, uh, which you get, in which case you get. You what get is the free. title? Sorry, China and the Middle East, I'm sorry. Uh, OK, we pass that book around. For sure. I will uh, upload it into the folder, research oh, yeah. folder. Oh. But I, I've, I've autographed this copy to give to one of the other presenters. Uh, so, uh, okay. um, but it's, as a China in the Middle East, if you Google Scobell, China in the Middle East Rand, I guarantee it'll come up. I pretty much guarantee it'll come up. Um, and the last thing, uh, this is the uh, last pu publication that uh, my remarks are based on, is the book uh, China's Search for Security, um, which is published uh, by Columbia University Press in 2012. And uh, actually, there's a pretty useful, of course, you have to pay for that, um, but if you have a access to uh, re databases, there's an article in Foreign Affairs published in 2012 uh, that uh, I co-authored uh, with, uh, with Andy Nathan, the other author of the, of the book, uh, looking about looking at really how China looks at the United States, but I think that leads me to say uh, that what you're about to hear, I think, think about it in terms of how understanding how China views the world, or the world according how China views the world according to me, right? Uh, fair enough. Um, but and where the Middle East fits in the bigger picture. And I know I guess Africa's ta tactile there too, but I really. Um, a lot of what I say is, is relevant to Africa too, um, but uh, I'm trying to give you a big picture, and then you're going to hear you're going to hear a lot more detail in other presentations than we heard yesterday about China and the Middle East more specifically. So uh, with that, 
I think you had a presentation on the Belton Road yesterday, right? so I'll touch on that too. But I'm a big fan of The Economist, and they have, the, if for no other reason, they have the best covers. Um, you know, Planet China, what to make of the Belt and Road Initiative. And, you know, if you're a cynic, you talk about the Belt and Road Initiative, it's, it's about all roads and railways lead to Beijing. <laughs> right? Um, but, uh, and there's, and there's some, some truth to that. But anyway, I'll, I'll touch on that too, and you can draw on what you heard yesterday, either to say, yeah, that makes sense. Um, or that doesn't what you said this morning doesn't comport with what I what I heard yesterday or what I what I read about. Um, so those are the those are uh, parameters of what I'm going to uh, talk about today. Um, so I used to used to give this presentation with that superimposed on that because this is kind of dull and boring and and that's more colorful. But anyway, I, I think I, as I thought about this cover, uh, this uh, title slide, it seemed that uh, it gives the impression that China's over there in the distance, and the Middle East is over, you know, quite well removed from China. And what what I'm going to suggest is that's not quite the way China sees it. The middle, from China's perspective, the Middle East is much closer. Uh, uh, you know, articles are much closer than they appear in the mirror. Uh, so, whoops, wrong one. There we go. Okay. So this idea of uh, concentric, four concentric circles of insecurity is, is drawn from China's search for security. And I actually t talk about it, I think, in my chapter in the, the Red Star and the, the Red Crescent, uh, or the Crescent. Um, but it's a conception of uh, how, if, you sit, if you're sitting in Beijing, how you, how you view the world, or what the world looks like when you view the world. Now, I just, had a, I just regurgitated this in an article that was pu recently published uh, on a different subject, and somebody said to me, hey, where does this come from? How do you know that's the way Chinese see the world? Because I had to footnote myself. <laughs> which is always uh, a, a, you know, uh, something you have to think about. But let's put it this way. When I have given this conception to uh, audiences in China, th analysts in China, Beijing, Shanghai, Nanjing, and other places, and no one's ever said to me, Andrew, you're wrong. And a lot of the people I talk to, I've been talking to for decades. And they're not afraid to tell me, Andrew, you're full of it. You know, if I say something and they say, no, you're wrong. So I'm fairly confident that this, this conception that I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes is actually pretty close to, pretty close to reality. So there are four concentric circles that I call four, four rings of insecurity. Uh, the first, is, uh, first ring is everything is basically domestic, right? It's everything in that red, everything within China's borders. And actually, you'd add Taiwan. It doesn't really pop out on here. And probably part of the, at least part of the South China Sea, uh, but it's domestic. The first ring, the second ring, China's periphery. This uh, sort of yellow, orangey bit. That's China's periphery, and the be and the, the precise geographic boundaries of these rings is kind of fungible, squeegee, fungible, uh, Gumby-like. Anyone know, remember Gumby? And so that actually remember that term because. It helps explain why I'm arguing, why I try, try to, I'm arguing that the Middle East is much more important to China, much more immediate to China than, than it's, uh, it, it, might, it might otherwise appear. The third ring is China's, is the green, uh, um, area in green, and that is basically China's Asia Pacific neighborhood. Uh, and then the fourth ring is everything else, the rest of the world. And the reason why I've colored, that there's some things colored in blue, is because this, this graphic was created for a research project I completed looking at China's role in, quote, the developing world. And by the developing world, we looked at everything except for Europe, North America, and, and Northeast Asia. So I highlighted the Middle East, just so you can see. And as I said, a minute ago, this is rather fungible, so perhaps, probably, probably, I should say, Turkey should be included, at least as China thinks about the Middle East. And certainly, 
a new a concept I'm going to throw at you in a, in a, in a couple of minutes. Um, so think about these as not precise geographic boundaries, but more in terms of uh, you're sitting in Beijing, uh, how, how Chinese leaders look at the world. Uh, so China, you know, we're used to hearing that the Chinese are coming. We've got a trade war with China. Uh, so China seems to be loom very large for the United States and other countries all around the world. And, and yet, uh, yet China um, is, not, is not so much a global power, I would argue, um, but it has global presence. You know, Chinese is economic, economically is present everywhere in terms of whether it's Chinese products, Chinese made products, whether it's Chinese businessmen and women, whether it's Chinese tourists, whether it's Chinese uh, uh, um, uh, students, they're everywhere. Of course, they're concentrated more in some countries and others, some regions of the world than others. Um, but estimates, and by the way, the interesting thing is Chinese, China's foreign ministry does not keep official statistics on how many of its nationals, of its citizens, are where in the world. Um, so it's, it's kind of, get, you have to use guesstimates. So um, one very good book um, about China in Africa estimates there are one million Chinese in Africa, in the continent of Africa. Uh, the work I did uh, suggests that, uh, or look, sources I looked at suggest there you know, several hundred thousand Chinese citizens in in the Middle East, but these are all these are all these are all estimates. So, China has a global presence, um, um, but it's not necessarily. It's still much more accurate to describe China as a regional power. Region meaning the Asia Pacific, which of course excludes um, areas outside of that, including uh, the Middle East. So. Uh, the most important ring is this first ring for Chinese, Chinese leaders. Fundamentally, we're talking about regime security. Regime meaning the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party, Communist Party rule. And so national security uh, for the leaders of the Chinese Communist Party begins in the street outside the policymaker's window. So what are they most concerned about? Um, protests, demonstrations, disorder, uh, which, which, from their, uh, from Chinese leaders' perspectives, is 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 the most worrisome thing, uh, and so, and they're they're worried about that primarily. They're also concerned about negative external influences that that sort of mesh or link up with internal domestic turmoil. So if you heard that you've heard the term color revolutions, you know these uh, uh, movements in various in, in various countries that are that are less than democratic, shall we say, uh, popular pressure for a democratic change, right? and this is bottom up, pretty much bottom up. But from China's pers the leadership's perspective in China, these things are very worried um, that uh, that they might uh, that, that 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 those ideas and those influences spill over into China, it could undermine, in their view, Communist, communist Party rule. Uh, so these are, this is the, the first ring is the most important. The second ring, not surprisingly, uh, is second most important. So China is very concerned about instability and threats around its borders. Um, you know, in some ways, uh, it, I think it's accurate to say that China has never had the People's Republic of China, maybe even pre-1949 uh, China, has never had a more uh, stable environment in its neighborhood. And yet, Chinese leaders still continue, continue uh, to be very, uh, very worried about um, their neighborhood and especially their immediate periphery. So it tends to be, you know, China has resolved most of its, almost all of its land border uh, borders with, uh, with the exception of the border with India, which is a very big exception. Right? And as, as I'm sure you've noticed, there have been tensions, on and off tensions, on the border um, uh, over these disputed territories. But 
by and large, China has resolved its territorial issues, so that's a good thing. And yet, Chinese leaders are still concerned, uh, and they're also concerned about instability, about weak or fragile states on, on their border. So as you might imagine, uh, North Korea uh, is, is a, is a perennial, has been a perennial concern in, in recent decades. Uh, from, from Beijing's perspective, they're worried about you know, this North Korea unraveling um, and, border, uh, and, and refugees flooding across the border. They're also worried about the prospect of a war in the Korean Peninsula, and that's literally China's doorstep. In fact, China's uh, foreign minister described it as China's doorstep uh, a few years ago. So, but it's not just there. You've got uh, countries, uh, the Central Asian uh, republics, which are, quote, stable in the sense that uh, they're run by dictators. Uh, but what happens when those dictators die? Or, because a number of them are aging, or there is pressure, pressure for change, um, Chinese leaders worry about that. Chinese analysts worry about that. And then Russia may look threatening to the United States, especially all the stories we hear about Russian meddling in, in, in the US and, and uh, all the, the trouble that's that Russia's causing, in, in, especially in Europe. And yet, even, even Chinese worry that, well, what about what happens after Putin? So even Russia, and Russia is, you know, it's not as big as the Soviet Union, but a destabilized Russia is bad news for China. So these are the, these are the concern, concerns that uh, 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 are in the minds, in the minds of Chinese, uh, Chinese leaders. So if you if you sort of buy my argument that Chinese leaders are most concerned about that first ring keeping order, stability inside that first ring, then logically you might say, well, why, are they, why have they embraced the world? Why are they more engaged, more globally active than they've ever been before? If they were that worried, wouldn't they just close China off? The way China did, by the way, under Mao. They closed themselves off, closed themselves off and uh, focused on autarkic you know, economic development. Well, the answer, my answer to that is that Chinese leaders in the 21st century have bought the Kool-Aid of globalization. Uh, what I mean by that is, you know, what's been the most remarkable thing in China in the post mao era since the late 1970s? It's been economic modernization, economic development, right? which, is, which has lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. There's still very poor people in China. Um, but there's a burgeoning middle class. There's a whole class of millionaires uh, in China today. And uh, so overall, that has been a huge economic success. And why, Chinese leaders have concluded, why has that been a success? Because China has opened itself to the world. So they've got to watch these negative, potential negative influences coming in. Uh, but China, uh, the leaders of the Communist Party have concluded has no alternative but to continue to remain open to the world. Because to close China off would mean threatening that economic dynamism and growth. And that would actually, uh, in, their, in Chinese leaders' views, uh, cause more problems and potentially great instability when Chinese people get, uh, um, bear the brunt of that. And who are they going to blame? They're going to blame their own leaders. So in, in a sense, the number one priority of China's leaders, of course, keep themselves in power, but keep the economy booming as much as, much as they can through all kinds of stimulus, or stimuli, I should say. So the, the term that you often hear from academics and, and thoughtful journalists is that the number one priority of the Chinese Communist Party is regime survival. Survival. I, I personally think that's a very misleading term because survival, you know, 
you think about naked and afraid and survivor and people you know being desperate to keep alive, living on the edge, right? Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party ain't living on the edge. They aren't worried about being overthrown tomorrow or next week or next month or next year. But what they are worried about is several years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, is there going to be a, a People's Republic of China? Because they've seen what happened to the, the late great former Soviet Union, what's happened to other communist, uh, former communist uh, regimes or current communist regimes uh, that seem to be uh, eroding, whose power seems to be eroding, such as Cuba uh, and perhaps even arguably Vietnam. So the Communist Party ain't worried about collapsing tomorrow. So I suggest the better term is, it's about rather than regime survival, regime perpetuation. Right? Because when you think about it, if you are logically, at least to me, if you think that you're going to, you may not survive until next week, your, your thinking is going to be very immediate. Right? How do I survive today? How do I survive for, for next week? What do I need to do? But Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party thinks medium term and it thinks long term. And it thinks big. Mega projects, massive projects. A perfect, uh, a, a prime example, a uh, contemporary example is the Belt and Road Initiative. Right? Why would China do that if it was uh, if Chinese leaders were worried about surviving um, uh, in the short term? They're thinking big, but thinking big and thinking long term doesn't mean uh, they're not paranoid and worried about their long term, medium term existence. So I use the term ambitious alarmists. So you know they're worried. They are paranoid. Um, but that doesn't stop Chinese leaders from thinking, like Xi Jinping and his colleagues, from thinking big. Right? And so when you, t you know, we're not talking about the South China Sea, but uh, I just uh, finished an article on that. And when you look at different countries, including China, have claims in the South China Sea. China's not, and China's not the only country that's been building artificial islands and developing things. But China is the only country that's done it in a mega, mega way, a massive way, in an unprecedented scale. China has been building artificial islands, or what the former uh, commander of the Pacific Command, the Pacific Command, called a Great Wall of Sand. Right? So China, China, Chinese leaders think big. They have ambitious plans. They may be worried about um, maintaining their rule indefinitely, but they're certainly, they certainly haven't stopped them from planning long-term, medium-term, big plans, including Belt and Road, including focused on, on regions around the world, including, uh, most relevant to us, uh, the Middle East. Right. And I so, think this is a quick question. Sure, <laughs> so sure, go ahead. Because this is super cool again, like I said yesterday. So about this perpetuation you're talking, yeah. talking about, I see the economic things they're doing, yes. but in their long-term range, do they want to plant seeds of communism, or it's just suffice to have the Belt and Road Initiative and to have businesses there and the Chinese everywhere? They don't care about trying to say this is the string that goes with that. You must subscribe to some aspects of communism. Okay, good, good question, and and, and I would categorize it as as the, as the appropriate kind of question. Okay. Uh, for, for the, so. Yes, technically, the Communist Party is still communist. You know, they still mouth the words that there are no true believers in, in, the, in the substance of, of Marxism, Leninism, and Nazi thought. But if you read the Chinese Communist Party Constitution or the People's Republic of China's Constitution, it's, it's still, those things are still in there. Uh, so it's really more about a more instrumental view of communism that you know, we're the Communist Party, uh, we know what's best for China, we've done, by the way, we've done a pretty good job, with a few minor exceptions, and so you, we deserve to remain in power. Uh, and so, and when, for Chinese foreign policy, it, it's very pragmatic. It's about, it's about making money, uh, improve, you know, advancing China's national interests. They don't care about ideology, except, and I'm just finishing a project that, that I won't talk about much more, except, except to say that 
we use the term ideology in this in this uh, project, uh, and what we mean by that is less about Marxism, Leninism, but more about how Chi Chinese thinking about how the world should be run and how governments should operate. Right. What, going back to the color, what Chinese leaders are really worried about is dangerous ideas, whether they're religious ideas or, or political ideas, or ideas of, of ethnicity that don't quite jive with their, the official view um, of, of China and, and China as a multi-ethnic country. Um, so those political ideas, China's very worried about um, Western style, what they call bourgeois democracy. One person, one vote, um, and so those those ideas are worrisome. But they're 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 very happy to work with uh, democratic countries or with with dictatorships. They, they don't really care. But they are the ideology still exists in the sense that it's they're concerned about nefarious ideas of democracy and human rights undermining their political system, and so. They're quite happy to work with dictators around the world, both for mutual benefit, material benefit, and also to get their support to push back against those annoying, potentially subversive Western efforts, Western efforts or, or efforts by democratic countries to try and uh, push human rights agendas and, and meddle in the internal affairs of other countries. So China has uh, a Going back to the 1950s, something called the Five Principles of Peaceful Coexistence. You heard of? Uh, so it, it's and it really boils down to you can Google it and find the, you know what those five principles principles are. But it basically boils down to non-interference in the internal affairs of other countries, right? So China is serious about that, and they don't want other countries telling China what to do or. or or criticizing China's human rights record. Um, and at the same time, they proclaim that they won't do that to other countries. And so they, they do take that really seriously. So that, I think that's kind of an element, could be considered an element of ideology. You know, compare that to the US position. You know, we like to think we can tell other countries, criticize other countries' human rights, and tell them what to do because we're morally superior. Um, or at least we've, we've seen that uh, a better we are the future, and we, you know, we know better than, than other countries. Um, and sometimes we do, and, some, and sometimes we don't. But sorry, I didn't, I didn't give you a, a short answer. To your no, question. no, I, but it's a good, but it's a really, it was a very good question. The, the last point is that years ago, when China wasn't active all over the world, and they were still back in the 50s, the 60s, the 70s, even the 80s, it wasn't until the 90s. That China really became a, had a, started having a global presence, a real global presence. But up until the 1990s, the five principles of peaceful coexistence resonated very strongly with countries, especially third world countries, who were tired of Europeans and Americans telling them, you know, how they should how, how they should organize themselves and, and uh, in order to get aid and assistance and, and preferential treatment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we're really receptive to the Chinese view that look, we're not going to judge you, you know, whatever domestic conditions, uh, whatever cultural and, and, and political uh, things that you have going on, that's your business. And that, and, and that was very welcoming uh, for a lot of countries, especially African countries, um, by the way. But back then, up until the 90s, China really couldn't, wasn't doing anything to contradict that that ideology. But fast forward to today, China is meddling in countries around the world. So in uh, an increasing number of countries, uh, they're still hearing that five principles of peaceful coexistence rhetoric, but the reality where the rubber meets the road, China is actually starting to meddle in countries, uh, countries' politics uh, and uh, to protect their own, not for ideological reasons, but to simply protect their their investments in those in those countries, so it's a much more complicated picture. Um, uh, China's uh, interactions, uh, especially with the developing world, and that would include uh, the Middle East and and Africa.
All right, it was a really good question, a really short question, but it uh, had a, an excruciatingly long answer. But hopefully it was, hopefully it was uh, useful. Um, yeah. Let's see. Uh, next two. All right, so what are, what are, what are China's uh, top interests in the Middle East? Uh, there are multiple reasons to, to suggest that, uh, China, that the Middle East is increasingly important to China. And arguably, uh, the most, I used to argue until I did crunch, or colleagues of mine crunched some data, uh, and, and so there isn't a little asterisk here. I used to argue that the Middle East was the most important region outside of the Asia Pacific to China. But there are some reasons, uh, especially uh, quantitative reasons, to suggest that Africa rivals it. Uh, China is very active in Africa too, uh, but I still argue that in China's worldview, you know, the numbers say something, but remember perception and reality aren't necessarily the same thing. I, th I still think from a, a, in Chinese, Chinese thinking, the Middle East looms much larger, even if uh, in, in, in many ways uh, China is much more involved in Africa uh, than it is than it is in the Middle East, so uh, worth worth thinking about. What and, and here are some reasons why I think though the, the Middle East is, is important. It's a, to, to to China. It's about energy resources or access to energy resources, particularly petroleum. Um, I haven't looked at the latest statistics, uh, but uh, certainly, if not the majority of China's imported petroleum comes from the Middle East. Uh, the large, the most, it's the most important source. Uh, the Middle East and, and, and the Gulf is the most important single source of, of uh, imported petroleum to China. And China, uh, it's uh, easy to, to overlook, uh, China was self-sufficient up until 1993 in, uh, in, for petroleum. Uh, but in, after, the, after the early 90s, China was a net, became a net importer oil and you know, the, logic, the reason for that is, is fairly logical. China's economy took off and it needed much more petroleum and it's, it's, uh, it's oil, the oil fields within China uh, were not able uh, to satisfy its demand. So this dependence on overseas ener energy imports is a worry. It is a worry and sometimes it's referred to as the Malacca Dilemma. Uh, Malacca being the Straits of Malacca, which uh, in, in Southeast Asia, uh, where, uh, you know, where, where a good portion of world trade goes through, uh, including uh, a lot of uh, oil uh, from, from the Middle East. There are pipelines to China uh, from Central Asia and, uh, 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 and from, from Russia, uh, but most of China's uh, imported petroleum comes, comes Via the ocean, and a good chunk of it comes from comes from the Middle East. Overseas interests, uh, an, an, an increasingly important term. If you look at Chinese official documents, like the most recent uh, Defense White Paper, among other documents, this term overseas interests come up again and again. Uh, so yes, China's core interests um, are, are most important. But overseas interests are becoming increasingly important because of China's global presence. What are these interests? Uh, I, I like to say they usually boil, they pretty much boil down to people and stuff. People, the, the, the citizens that China has around the world, and a lot of them, uh, a good number of them are working in, con in, in countries that are, are less than politically stable, uh, may be threatened by terrorism, and so they've got to worry about the security and safety of their citizens. And, and you may say, well, hey, China's a dictatorship. Why should they care about some, you know, some of their people, um, some ordinary people who happen to be stuck, say, in, in Yemen when the you know what hits the fan? Why, what, why should, why should uh, China's communist rulers care about those people? They care about those people because uh, they have the, those people have the expectation now that they will, their government will take care of them, will do something to help them. I think you talked about Wolf Warrior 2 yesterday. So, you know, movies like that, 
indicate that people have an expectation that their government will look after them. And not only that, but they have the means to make a lot of noise when they don't get helped. China, Chinese have cell phones. Uh, cell phones are ubiquitous, uh, among, uh, just like they are in, in many countries. And uh, if they're stuck somewhere and they need help, they have the ability uh, to uh, uh, express those views and, and uh, communicate with people back home. And so that puts pressure on the Chinese Communist Party rulers to do something about it because it looks bad. A big part of, of China's, uh, the Communist Party gets credit for a number of things, but two things are the most important. Credit uh, for the economic miracle uh, in China. Everyone's been, uh, become, almost everyone's become more prosperous, um, and the Communist Party gets credit for that. Also, uh, the Chinese Communist Party gets credit for uh, the fact that China seems to be much more respected in the world as a great power. Uh, so uh, so uh, great powers look after their people. Uh, and uh, so from, from the Communist Party's uh, point of view, if China, if they look weak or in, in, impotent uh, to protect their people, take care of their people, and, and uh, stand up for, for China's interests around the world, this reflects poorly on them and undermine, potentially undermines the legitimacy of the Communist Party. So this, this uh, status is a great power. Yes, the, the Communist Party wants other countries to, to treat China with respect, that looks good. But they also, just as important is, if not more important, from their, in their view, is that the ordinary people of China think that their government is respected and, 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 and has the power, the status of a great power. And that, that, that means taking care of their own, their own people, uh, Chinese citizens all over the world when they get into trouble. Yes, ma'am. It just sounds like they're fearful of losing the mandate of heaven. Yeah. I mean, that, yeah. that's just, right. it fits in with, you yes. know, the respectability you know, reciprocity from the Confucian perspective. Right. Yes. So I think that's, in some ways, uh, it's not, uh, it, it's helpful, it, it's useful to think of uh, this as a new dynasty, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just like, and, and that certainly, if, if, if nothing else, Chinese, uh, all, all Chinese, but, uh, you know, more educated ones especially, have a very good understanding of their own history mm -hmm. and, and different dynasties. And dynasties obviously don't last forever. And so, what you know, it's just like the United States' predominance in the world. Are we the ex are we the exception? You know, will this continue forever? Some people argue yes, it will. But if you look at if you look at history, nothing nothing lasts forever. And you can quote me on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. As a follow up question to that, um, one of the things that Professor Otten mentioned yesterday was that the Chinese have established a number of Confucius institutes in Africa. Um, a smaller number, actually, um, and I, I have it somewhere, I can't pull it up really quickly, but I actually uh, asked one of my research assistants to, to chart on a, on a map of the world, dividing up into regions, where are these Confucius Institutes? And yeah. guess, well, where, where do you think, where are they mostly concentrated? Anyone guess? Okay. A lot of them in the United States, yes, in fact, the, the single largest number of Confucius Institutes is in the United States. But they're pretty much in the, concentrated in, the, in what I call the developed world. There are much fewer uh, Confucius Institutes in the developing world. So, you know, the Middle East, Africa, they're, 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 they do exist. Uh, but they're mostly concentrated in the developed world. I think that's, that's uh, you know, you can speculate on why that is. I, I, I certainly speculate, and, and one reason is that uh, they're mostly interested in trying to influence um, uh, you know, Western Western democracies. Uh, the, the not they're trying to influence ordinary people. That uh, you know China is not a threat. China is about you know learning and culture and and uh, a great civilization. Oh, and did I mention China is not a threat? Mm -hmm. um, but you know I'm not being. Has anyone had experience with Confucius Institutes? I mean, there's, there's one at George Mason. Yeah, and the, the first one in the country, in the U.S., was actually at, uh, at Maryland College Park. So, you know, 
I'm, I actually think they're a good idea, and they do good things. There was one at uh, Texas A&M University, and I worked very closely with the director of the Confucius Institute uh, to, to, to uh, kind of bring good, uh, programs to the community and to school, local schools. So I think they're a good, they're a good thing, but there's certainly an agenda. And of course there's an agenda if you're talking about the Goethe Institute or Alliance Francaise or you know, any of these things. Of course, it's an appendage of, of, of a government. Um, so I don't necessarily see anything nefarious, uh, but uh, you know, it's about trying to increase your country's influence. As I said, if you look at where they're concentrated, it seems like China's more focused on trying to influence certain areas of the world, uh, populations or publics in certain areas of the world over, over others. Um, so I talked about energy, overseas interests. Oh, so maintaining uh, stability in China and the Asian Pacific neighborhood. So, uh, as, I, as I said earlier, in some ways, Middle East seems far away from China. But uh, you know, from China's perspective, uh, it's about uh, the Middle East is important too because it's uh, a center of Islam. Um, there are uh, predominantly uh, Muslim uh, countries. And for China, that's, it, it's important to be friends with these countries and to inoculate themselves from criticism. What I, what I mean by that is, you know, China is 90 plus percent Han Chinese, right? So it's fairly, it's overwhelmingly one ethnic group. Now there are sub-ethnic groups too, but ethnic minorities make up about eight, 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 roughly eight percent of the population, but they tend to be concentrated in those peripheral areas or border frontier regions of China, especially Western China. And uh, there are, uh, you know, officially, China has freedom of religion, official. And there are state-sponsored churches. And by the way, I should mention that the, you know, there are very few countries that China does not have diplomatic relations with, uh, full diplomatic relations at the ambassador level. And one of them is the Holy See, the Vatican. Right? And so there is a Catholic church in China. But guess what? It's the patriotic Catholic church. It's not, and officially, the Catholic church in China does not um, go, uh, does not have uh, its, uh, you know, uh, take its orders, instructions, guidance uh, from, from the Vatican. It's complicated. There actually are some links, quasi-official links, some of which are tolerated, but technically it's not. Uh, similarly, there is a, a Muslim organization, Islamic organization, uh, that is uh, controlled or carefully monitored by the People's Republic of China. Uh, and so, Yes, there is some religious freedom, some degree of religion, certainly more than there was in Mao's China, to be fair. Uh, but it's far from complete freedom, complete freedom of religion. And what uh, China is very concerned uh, to avoid any criticism uh, of anything, uh, of anything, especially, especially uh, Islam and its treatment of um, Muslims and ethnic. Uh, uh, ethnic minorities. So, in particular, the Uyghurs. I think you had a, a presentation about the Uyghurs yesterday. I don't know what what figure was thrown around, but I think they're uh, they're roughly about nine million. I think nine million Uyghurs inside China. Most of them concentrated in the Xinjiang Autonomous Region out in western China. Uh, I think there's about one million uh, Uyghurs. The Uyghur diaspora, diaspora that spills over into Central Asian uh, countries. And is spread around the world. And one of the largest concentration is in Turkey, and the Uyghurs are ethnically Turkic. Uh, but what what China is worried about is is two two things uh, from from external uh, external challenges uh, linking up with or intersecting uh, with the, the uh, ethnic Uyghurs uh, or, or, and Muslim. Population in China. One is external support, uh, whether it's uh, especially, of course, subvert, uh, especially um, you know, radical extremists like funding, uh, providing military training or weaponry, or, or even just uh, 
external ideas uh, about how, how good Muslims um, should uh, comport themselves in China, how their relationship with the, with the government, etc. But the other part of this is they're very concerned, Chinese leaders are very concerned about quashing criticism by uh, Muslims overseas and especially uh, governments in the Muslim world. And by my reckoning, uh, and we have some smart people who are very much more knowledgeable about this than I who can contradict me, and, and please, Mohammed, feel free if, if, I, if, you say some, if I say something wrong um, uh, or you disagree with, but uh, they've been remarkably successful, um, in my view, about uh, encouraging or persuading countries, Muslim countries, including those in the Middle East, to not to criticize China uh, for their treatment of, 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 uh, of uh, Muslim uh, groups in, uh, in, in China. And there's one exception that I can think of. In 2009, there were the worst riots um, in China since 1989. What happened in 1989? Um, of course, there was the, the, the Tiananmen uh, uh, mass, uh, massacre, and hundreds of people, at least hundreds of people, were killed in and around Tiananmen Square in Beijing. In 1989, uh, there were very serious riots in, uh, in Urumqi, and hundreds of people died. They were, there were riots between uh, Han Chinese and, uh, and ethnic Uyghurs that got extremely ugly. And uh, you just see some of the photographs of that, uh, and, and it's, it, you realize how serious it was. In that, in that uh, one country criticized China, uh, and that was Turkey. Turkey's leader uh, criticized China back then. And China really got upset about that and worked very hard behind the scenes to improve, to make sure that never happened again. And, and they've, been, they've been pretty successful about that. Yes, ma'am? Wasn't there an attack in uh, Kunming? Did, did some of your come down? I mean, that's not the area where they usually are, the train station. Right. Well, that's, and, and so within China, I would not want to be an ethnic minority. I would not want to look Uyghur. And, I, and actually, I was, years ago, I was in, in Western China. I was, I was walking down the road an extremely hot day, uh, not dry heat, not humid heat like we have here in, in Washington. And I, I saw some kids coming home from school. And I said, hey, how are you doing in, in Chinese? And they asked me, are you Chinese? And I thought they were just joking around, but the more I thought about them, oh, they must think I'm an ethnic minority, you know. And so, uh, you know, if you, but if you look like you are from Central Asia, I think you have a really rough, or, or you have a really rough time in China. And I have a favorite restaurant in in in, in Beijing that's a Uyghur restaurant. And I just think they're in a Han neighborhood. They're in a Hutong, you know, a, a traditional neighborhood. And every time I go there, no problems, and there are Han Chinese sitting in there too, usually. But I think if, if, there's, if there's a riot or a, a quote, terrorist attack, a, a attack attributed to, I, assume, I would not want to be sitting in, the, I would not want to be working in or owning this restaurant because, you know, the local people might get really, you know, a, a local mob could easily form and this, kind, this restaurant could be, you know, go up in flames. Um, not challenge necessarily, but I have a different, slightly different sure. view. I don't necessarily think that the Chinese state has convinced Muslim countries to ignore this issue. I think rather what has happened is that the whole context and environment in the Middle East has changed. I mean, you have the Arab Spring, you have yes. the essential collapse of many Arab states, yes. and I think there's just fatigue about solidarity with transnational Muslim issues, both among Muslim populations, but also among Arab Muslim elites. So for them, even though developments in Xinjiang are worsening, they prefer to just put it aside because there's just too much to deal with back home. Okay. So I'm sure. not sure whether the Chinese have been successful necessarily, that's all. Well, yes, but keeping a lid on, uh, on public and, and, and overt criticism. But uh, yeah, so I think that's, that's, a really good, that, that's a really good point. And actually leads, I gotta keep moving here. Um, that uh, it, it leads to, you know, China wants to expand its influence in the Middle East, right? But the Middle East is a minefield. And the Chinese know that. 
because because of um, the turmoil, um, the uh, you know uh, the changes uh, in the in the Middle East, uh, countries in the Middle East. It, it's very Chinese leaders recognize it's a delicate situation. So yes, they want more influence, but they they're very wary about how they go about doing that because. They want to maintain friendship, good relations with all countries in the Middle East. And the remarkable thing is, so far, China has managed to do that, pretty much managed to do that, whether it's Israel or the Palestinian Authority or you know, Saudi Arabia or Syria or, uh, or um, Iran. China has pretty reasonably good relations with all of those countries. Uh, because of the turmoil, because of uh, some of the things that uh, Mohammed just mentioned, I think the question is: Is it real? Can that can that condition continue? And the answer is probably not indefinitely. But what China's so, Chinese leaders have relatively skillfully done so far is is symbolically look as if China plays a big role and has a lot of influence uh, outside. And economically, they definitely do. But in diplomatic, in, in the diplomatic realm and the military security realm, uh, China's influence is, is, is much less. And so Xi Jinping took forever, or a long time, I should say, a, a, a good number of years before he first visited the Middle East. He came to power in 2012, 2013. His first visit to the Middle East was in uh, 2016. And he visited three countries. Uh, and, and this underscores, and two of them I think are extremely important to, to China, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and, and Egypt. And his visit to Egypt, I think, uh, was really more uh, about uh, addressing the Arab League and, and, and showing that uh, China, showing solidarity uh, symbolically with the Arab world. So that is a difficult tightrope because China also has pretty good relations with Israel, right? And, and so managing to to balance all these relationships is particularly challenging. So China's had a special envoy for the Palestinian question uh, for a number of years. Uh, China's pro issued proposals for peace and, 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 and ideas. But I, I think these are best viewed as being rather uh, you know, symbolic uh, because China, the last thing China wants to do is get deeply involved in, these, in, in the Middle East the way, say, the United States tries to do, um, uh, because I think they realize that that is that they're dealing that they're dealing with a minefield, and this would it's very likely that those more substantive, serious efforts to mediate, whether it's between the Israelis and the Palestinians, or to address the problems in in Syria, uh, would would likely blow up in China's face, and so they want to appear uh, to be a uh, a great power and try to have more influence, but they're very careful about actually trying to implement that uh, implement that interest. All right, um, the term. Um, so how much? You're doing well. It's only ten. Okay. We still got a good long time. Okay. Uh, so the term I want to introduce, and I talk about it in my, uh, the chapter in the, the, book, the, the book that you have, the Greater Middle East. Now, of course, the Greater Middle East is a uh, term, I think, that uh, China didn't invent it. it. It came up, I think it was the, the Bush administration uh, that uh, came up with this term. Uh, and, but China, and a good number of Chinese analysts have embraced this term. So literally, da, 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 zhong dong. And zhong, of course, is the character for China. But China, I mean, China, uh, zhongguo literally means, of course, middle kingdom or central kingdom. So China uses the same term for the Middle East that we all do, right? Middle East, Dong is, is, is East, and Da is big, so uh, it's usually translated greater, greater Middle East. So I'll give you a moment to, to sort of peruse this. Uh, it was written in 2004, but I think it explains why, um, in my view, the Middle East it looms much larger than it might otherwise. If you think about the lesser Middle East or the rump Middle East, um, it's, it's a distance, quite a distance from China. But if you think in terms of a greater Middle East, which would include Central Asia and South Asia, 
uh, then all of a sudden that that region literally reaches out and touches China and spills over into China. So highlighting the collapse of the Middle East, meaning the, these new, uh, new independent countries in Central Asia, uh, harks back to the Silk Road. Uh, but see, the ethnic, religious, and cultural dimensions uh, do, uh, if you think about this, this uh, greater Middle East um, conception, does reach out and touch China. So uh, a strategic extension of China's western border region, and of course specifically, in particular, I should say, uh, Xinjiang. Right. So any, uh, any questions about this? It's a long quote, but I think I love long quotes when they say what I want them to say. I mean, that's, I'm an objective researcher, but uh, uh, you know, it's a, I think it's a pretty, uh, it really tells a story. Yes, Susie. Thinking about this, of course, for a room full of people who teach history, also ancient history, you know, this has like Silk Road written all over it, and it, it does indeed mention it. Um, so the the initial or, or the, the thrust of the One Belt One Road which stands to help develop or redevelop areas of the prior Silk Road is the focus on beyond the Silk Road connections with Asia and the, and the Middle East or is their concern also to ingratiate themselves with these countries and, and enhance um, economic relations with them? Uh, the, the Silk, uh, in some ways, the Silk, I think the Silk Road uh, or the new, the new thinking about the Belt and Road Initiative or One Belt, One Road or the new Silk, Maritime Silk Road, you know, any, is, is really about, uh, on the one hand, uh, projecting this idea that, see, China is not a threat. China is an opportunity. China an, represents an economic benefit for all countries. And in terms of you know, where does it go, what's the target, it's very vague. It's actually very vague. When you read, it's very hard to find an official authoritative, one official authoritative document in China that, dis, that clearly describes the Belt and Road and what it includes and what, what its precise goals are. It's kind of like um, you know, democracy or, or, or love. Who can be against love or democracy? But, you know, even, even the Chinese Communist Party says it's not against democracy. It's just, you know, that bourgeois kind that's, that causes chaos and turmoil, that's the kind we don't like. We, we want the Chinese-style democracy um, that, uh, that, that, is, that is more suited to our conditions. Right, so it's similar, uh, what China's tried to make the Belt and Road is all things to all people, so that it, uh, that no one, that no one's critical of it, no one pushes back against it. And if you are in China, if you are a state-owned enterprise or a businessman or a, or a uh, bureaucrat in a provincial bureaucrat somewhere, what do you want to do? You want a piece of that Belt and Road because that is official policy. And so you might get some money. You it might help you with your opportun opportun business opportunities. And so that's. Uh, the result is that it's kind of vague exactly when you try and say what is the Belt and Road. Uh, it's uh, and you know in Chinese. Funny you should say that. I'm going to skip to the. I think it's the next slide. Yeah. In in Chinese, even though it used to be called uh, in English, uh, ten, uh, one Belt, one Road. Now the preferred term is Belt and Road Initiative or BRI for short, but. In China, the best of my in Chinese, it's still Igai Lu. So literally, it means one belt, one road. And, and so uh, you know, it gets confusing. So where's that belt and where's that road? Which I think is why they changed the English translation to uh, belt and road because it's many belts, many roads. And so the belt is supposed to be an overland one, and uh, the the road is supposed to be a maritime silk road. And this, and the other thing is looking at finding a map, an authoritative map of what is the Belt and Road. What are these Belt and Road initiatives? There are so many maps out there, and actually some of them are very pretty and uh, and useful. But guess what? I have yet to find an an official, definitive map of that includes all Belt and Road initiatives. And I, I don't. Has anyone found a Belt and Road a map? Such a map. 
I mean, there's some great maps, the Wall Street Journal, other publications, other think tanks have put out great maps uh, of the Belt, Belt and Road initiatives and, and routes and, and so on. But to my knowledge, there is no official one put out by the Chinese, Chinese government. So, you know, this is, as I said, it, it, it's misleading. I think they changed, they changed the, the term in English because it is, implies one belt, one road implies there's only one of each. Well, in actual fact, uh, it's a lot more. It's a lot more complicated. I don't know what you heard yesterday. Um, does that comport or conflict with what you heard yesterday? Mm -hmm. I just saw a map this morning that showed the polar belt. Oh. So, like you say. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then and then you ask, well, and I did when I was in China uh, doing interviews a few years ago, and I said, well, what about? Uh, what about Latin America? Is that part of the Belt and Road? And somebody said, oh yeah. And I said, well, why not? You know, it's like, and, and I jokingly said, well, how about North America? We could use some help with our upgrading our infrastructure. You know? And I said, in fact, that would be a great idea, uh, you know, in improving China's image in, 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 the, in the U.S. Actually, one of my colleagues said, you know, construction of one, one big bridge somewhere in the U.S. can actually use Chinese steel. Um, so there's a little bit of that, but it means it's kind of a vague, all-encompassing term, and but it's also useful to understand it. I think as a, it's a, you know, it's a way to stimulate China's economy. Because this started, of course, it harks back to the Belt and Road, and some Chinese even talk about it as a, a, a Latter-day Marshall Plan, right? Uh, that we, that after after World War II, the, the U.S. Uh, launched in Europe to help reconstruction, uh, rebuild Europe. Um, I was going to say, sorry, blanked out. Probably wasn't that important. Yet, but, so, oh, no, no, what was? Oh, so yeah, it's an extension, a, a way for China to perpetuate uh, uh, the econo economic growth, which is really important. It started, uh, I, I think it's an extension of the. the, the the, the go west strategy or developments uh, develop the west strategy that started in the 1990s in China because uh, as you all know China is a, a vast country uh, most of the population is concentrated in the west I mean sorry the eastern part of the country especially the coastal uh, regions and coastal uh, and, and eastern provinces but further out west and by, by west China just doesn't doesn't just mean Xinjiang they include Tibet, Qinghai, um, even Sichuan, Gansu, uh, a, a good portion of, 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 of China's total area. But all that west is largely underpopulated compared to the rest of China and underdeveloped. And so Chinese leaders, as I said, they're very ambitious, they're very smart people. They realize we need, we need to stimulate our economy and it makes sense to develop the infrastructure in our west, in the west part, western part of China. So, you know, the one, the one quote provincial or, or autonomous re capital or an autonomous region that was not connected by a railroad for the lo for a long time was Lhasa. And now, because the reason, of course, is it's a real serious, significant engineering challenge. To build a railway up to Lhasa, you've got to you've got to deal with all kinds of challenges: the altitude, permafrost, you name it. But that was it was eventually built. Uh, you've got uh, you know, high-speed railway that doesn't just connect um, connect uh, cities in eastern China, um, but uh, is is stretching stretching west. So a logical extension of that. Domestic program was to take it take it beyond China's borders, and that's of course exactly what what has been done. And, all, and going back to this idea of the uh, you know the Belt and Road um, being kind of vague, what Xi Jinping has done, and he's pretty good at uh, he's he's pretty good he's a pretty good showman. Um, has he he included in that Belt and Road existing and and earlier other projects that have been were already on underway so everything became belt and road even if it even if it preceded his administration preceded his announcement of the belt and road in 2013. 
So it's, uh, it's, and you know, he gave two speeches, one in Central Asia and one in Southeast Asia, to launch the Belt and Road back in 2013. So, uh, you know, quibbling about nodes and routes and, and which, which is included and which isn't uh, underscores, I think, the larger point that this is a, this is, this is Xi Jinping's flagship foreign policy initiative. And uh, it's meant to promote, look, make him look good. It's meant to look, make China look good. And ideally, I mean, there's nothing, I think it's a great idea. Anything that can help develop infrastructure around the world is a great idea. We just got to hope it, it's not shoddy. It actually lasts. It doesn't promote uh, you know, corruption. And interesting, does anyone know, maybe you talked about yesterday, um, the largest, the one country that has the largest single commitment, public commitment of funds by China as part of the Belt and Road? Anyone know? Pakistan? Yes. Pakistan. Would you say? Pakistan. Pakistan, Pakistan is the one country uh, that's, that's gotten the biggest commitment, public commitment of Chinese funds. And you know, Pakistan is not the most stable country in the world. Um, and you think, why did China do that? And uh, I think one of the reasons is because Ch Pakistan is right on China's border, and it abuts Western China, and so if uh, China, uh, China has great, a lot of interest in trying to help develop Pakistan's economy and stabilize the country, uh, and plus China uh, or Pakistan is probably the closest thing China has uh, to an ally in the world. Um, they have a very good long-standing relationship, and if you talk to uh, Pakistanis, um, you know they think about the United States as being a very unreliable partner. Whereas China is the, has been their all-weather friend, and, and, and China has stuck with them over the years and supported them. Uh, where, when uh, for Pakistan, their biggest challenge, uh, aside from internal challenges, is has been India, a constant challenge. But also, uh, China is very concerned about Afghanistan, right? And uh, Afghanistan, from a Chinese perspective, is the epicenter. Of, um, of instability in the, in, in central uh, in Central Asia and, and in China. So China is very worried that as the U.S. draws down, declares victory, or, or, and goes home, uh, that and doesn't solve the problem uh, or improve things. That things will continue. Uh, things will uh, any of the progress that's been made will will be rolled back. And that instability will um, tri uh, you know, ripple out through Central Asia and, and to China. And who's the most important country, aside from the US in, pa in Afghanistan? It's Pakistan, right? So there are many good reasons why China uh, uh, wants to give significant economic assistance and, and improve the infrastructure and uh, encourage economic development in, in Pakistan. Even though, as I said, it's a surprising, in some ways, a surprising um, uh, target. Also, I think they border. Yes, the they countries. do. They do. Yes. Right. So there. So anyway, that's. So the Belt and Road, uh, you know, it is not surprisingly to serve, uh, to stimulate China's economy and also to serve the purposes uh, uh, of Chinese foreign policy, China's national, China's national. Are the Chinese not only enhancing a port, but also fast train? They're doing two kinds of infrastructure building in Pakistan. Yeah, they're trying to do. Uh, I'm not. I, I'm not sure of all the details, but they're just trying to. It, it's pretty ambitious, and there are multiple yes. projects. And by the way, India is not very happy about this because some of the, at least one of the projects, is undisputed territory between uh, India, uh, in dispute between India and Pakistan. And so India is one of the few countries that has publicly criticized the Belt and Road Initiative and publicly said they're out of it, um, they're officially out of it, uh, which, which, is, uh, which is rather interesting. I'm going to try and wrap up really quick and then uh, unless you have a quick question. You said Arab News has a $55 billion project. It's going to involve the shipment of LNG to uh, gas and this is in, in Pakistan. Yeah. yeah. And, the, and, and uh, of course, the Indians are very worried about you know, what, what this might 
what the project might mean and, and, and a closening, a strengthening of ties between <coughs> China and, and Pakistan. And uh, they're particularly concerned about, also concerned about ports, like what are, which uh, is, is a interesting, uh, interesting uh, question. But I, I want to try and wrap things up here and bring, bring us back to the, bring us back to the Middle East and then I'm happy to, to answer questions or, or, or take comments. Um, you know, China for, uh, for the first time last year opened it, uh, an overseas military base. Anyone know where it was? Djibouti. And Djibouti you know, is technically in Africa, but I'd say it's much more, uh, its significance is very much tied to the Middle East. And so, you know, China's been uh, increasingly active. Um, Militarily, but in a very modest way, in terms of peacekeeping in Africa uh, and and the Middle East, um, since 2008, uh, China has been involved. Uh, Ch China's uh, navy has been involved, and also in a very modest way, in anti-piracy patrols in the Gulf of Aden. Uh, so those are relatively modest operations, um, but you throw in China's increasing uh, economic in interests in the region and the growing numbers of Chinese uh, citizens involved uh, living and working in the region. And you know, 2011, speaking about uh, you know, um, instability and, and uh, popular revolutions and uh, uprisings in the Arab world, a big wake-up call for China was 2011, Libya. There were 30, at least 36,000 Chinese who were stuck in Libya, and they wanted to get out, not surprisingly, um, when things started to un unravel. Uh, and uh, China was really stretched to do that. And, and there was a very, very, very peripheral role, minor role for the Chinese military. They actually, um, th they were able to bring some uh, air transports and a couple of ships uh, to bear because they just happened to have some in the, in the neighborhood. Uh, but the lion's share of the people who were evacuated from Libya were evacuated on civilian vessels. Um, to, to places like Greece, uh, including on uh, ocean liners and uh, you know, cruise ships, anything that the Chinese government could hire. And it wasn't a flawless operation, uh, but they did manage to get uh, everyone, everyone, I don't believe any Chinese uh, died, but there have been Chinese who have been, have been killed uh, um, in, uh, and kidnapped and uh, held for ransom in countries around the, around the region. And so that, that also underscores uh, to China, China's leaders that you know, they, they have limited options to try and protect their citizens, and they need to try and do more. So Djibouti uh, is, uh, is, is important um, because it, it can help facilitate these kinds of operations. And the hardest thing uh, for those three uh, naval vessels conducting anti-piracy operations is how do they get resupplied? It's all about logistics. And of course, you can show up in any port, as long as you've got cash, right? You can buy fresh food and, 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 uh, and things like that. Uh, but it certainly helps uh, to have a, a base. It's more of a logistics, a glorified logistics facility, but it's, it, it's important. Uh, it, it can play an important, it signalizes, I think, that the Middle East and Africa is becoming uh, more important uh, to, uh, to China. And in some ways, I think the Belt and Road, uh, if, you, if you think about the, overseas, the, the overland, thank you, overland uh, uh, belt and uh, maritime road, the nexus, if there is such a thing, of the belt, that Belt and Road, in my view, is kind of the Middle East. So if you think about that, and as I said, I'm, I'm oversimplifying, right, because I just told you there was no such thing as one belt and one road. Uh, but where they, where they may, if you think about them uh, as uh, uh, in a larger context, where might they intersect or meet? I would say um, the crossroads, uh, you can think of it uh, as being in or, or near the Middle East. And so I, uh, to my mind, that helps uh, underscore why, uh, why the Middle East uh, seems to, uh, is a growing, uh, of growing importance. So the, if, remember the term Greater Middle East. If you think about the term uh, greater, greater Middle East uh, versus just Middle East, then 
going back to those four rings of, of insecurity, those four concentric circles, the greater Middle East spans or overlaps, spills over into all four of those rings from a Chinese perspective. And hence, the Middle East, the greater Middle East, uh, is uh, much more, um, matters much more uh, to China in 2018 than it has probably since the, since the original Silk Road. So I'm going to stop there.